My name is Ethan Smith and I work for Garden City Harvest currently here in town. I've worked for Garden City Harvest on and off for about six years now. Um, and I, while I was working for them, I got my master's uh, in environmental studies doing uh, agroecology. So this is sort of the study of the ecology of agricultural systems. So basically, just, just so you know the order that I'm planning on going in and you'll kind of know where different information will come throughout this uh, process. I want to start talking about the, um, as, as ecologists, we, we consider the, them, and Zach's heard me say it, the biotic and the abiotic factors in composting, which means the living things and then the things that are not alive, the environment and other chemical factors in compost piles. Um, from there, we're going to talk about the construction of compost bins, which we have some great examples of here, um, and where you can find plans and whatnot. And then we'll definitely spend a good chunk of time talking about actually making compost. Um, of, from different materials, um, getting into what you can compost and what you can't or shouldn't. There are two other um, uh, microscopic organisms. Uh, there are ones called actinomycetes, which are um, actually a type of bacteria, but they're the ones that are responsible for that smell you smell in like wet soil. You go out walking after rain, you say, oh, it smells like like rich, dark earth. And there's a smell called, or it's a compound called geosmin that actinomyces give off, and it's just a little trivia for you, that it's geosmin that you're smelling, and it's the presence of actinomyces in the soil, which gives it that smell, and they don't hang out in soil that's not healthy. So if, you, if it smells good when it's wet, it's probably because it's healthy and it's full of those actinomyces. And their um, job in a compost pile is to break down things that are bigger and more complex. The bacteria are the smallest organisms in this whole lot, and they work on the smallest particles. You think of like um, a baby, their mouth is really small and their stomach isn't very developed, so they eat you know, stuff that's ground up like a paste, stuff that's really small. Moving up to the actinomyces, say those are the bacteria, the actinomyces are breaking down larger things, they can get in, they're, they're bigger, they can break stuff apart, and then when they're finished with it, the crumbs that are left over are scooped up by more bacteria. And then even larger than the actinomyces are the, the fungi, the, the funguses that live in a compost pile, and they have what are like roots that are called um, hyphae that, that travel for many feet through the soil, which doesn't sound like much unless you think about the fact that these the hyphae are, are microscopic in themselves, so for that to be feet long, it's it's a pretty amazing one. And they use that hyphae to sort of bore into the, the even larger particles, and that breaks it apart just like a, a plant's roots break up your the sidewalk out in front of your house. Um, so uh, those three are actually breaking down um, the compost pile by by ingesting substances and then either they excrete the waste and that is is more broken down and travels further down the waste stream or um, by them just consuming things they break stuff apart. And on the largest level of organisms in our compost pile we have things like centipedes, earthworms, the, the, the macro organisms that um, Pretty much what they're doing is just breaking stuff into smaller pieces. Um, and without all those organisms, our compost pile would sit there for years and years and years and not ever look any different. Um, the chemical changes that happen in a compost pile, yeah, they're chemical, but they wouldn't happen. Should we have juice water? <laughs> you know, um, for the most part, you don't have to. Around here, we have plenty of earthworms. As long as you're not, if you're, if you're composting on, say, an asphalt parking lot and um, they have no way to get in there, then yeah, you probably will need to. Or a worm bin in your basement. But for the most part, if you create a good environment in a compost bin, the worms will come to you. And most of them as well. Yeah. So that was kind of my question too, because we do have to do an encased compost. Mm -hmm. um, so what type of worm would you suggest and like how many? So before I answer that, can you explain what, what, what do you mean by encased compost? Like um, we have those, that we just ordered the like circular compost, you mm -hmm. know, that you can wheel over to the garden and then you just kind of turn it, you know, it's it's pretty basic. But, okay. So and yeah, why, why do you be, have to do that? Is it just your, the space you're doing it in? Yeah, yeah. It's just the space. And um, you know, they're it, small, I mean, to, to very simply small red worms like the ones you would see in a garden okay. um, are the type of worm you wouldn't be using the huge night crawler okay. type worms and I my my knowledge of 
specific worm species is not that great, but I know many people who have dug up worms from a garden, added them in, and they very quickly will multiply. Awesome. And there are companies on the internet, if you Google mm -hmm. that, they, okay. they will sell you whatever you want. Cool. So like if they're in the space where the garden would be, then use those? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, and as far as any of the others, your the bacteria, the actinomyces, the fungi, um, it is extremely rare that you'll be in a situation where you need to add any of that mm -hmm. to your compost pile. Um, a lot of times, uh, if people are having a hard time, they think that they're not having enough of that microbial activity, you can add either some manure or some old aged compost. It's full of those organisms, and they very quickly, if the conditions are right in your pile, will be fruitful and multiply. Um, but there are companies out there, um, you know, there are always companies out there that if they think they can sell us something, they will market it to us. And there are companies that will market inoculants for your compost pile, and I really don't think it's necessary. The only reason it would be necessary is, again, if you're working in a, an enclosed environment, or if you're, if everything that's going in there is, seems like it's going to be sterile. You're composting nothing but, um, you know, industrial food waste from somewhere where it was boiled until it was sterile. It's hard to imagine that happening though. And we'll talk more about what will go into the pile and kind of why it's almost impossible to have a sterile compost pile. Um, so that's the biotic side of it. The, the abiotic side, the more environmental and physical side of a compost pile, the most important thing that's going in there, um, the two most important things to sustain that life are oxygen and water. Just like none of us can survive without oxygen, or, um, or being hydrated, all the organisms in the compost pile absolutely require oxygen to uh, undergo the decomposition process and they absolutely need moisture if they're gonna live. So if you have an enclosed compost bin, you, it needs, most of them these days, they, the old prototypes um, didn't always allow for adequate aeration, but it should have side vents, something that'll allow air to circulate. And if it's, if it's fairly enclosed, you need to make sure that you're adding moisture if it doesn't have the ability to get wet through rainfall or whatnot. Um, Is the rainfall sufficient even in Montana? Uh, around here, usually no. I mean, we get, at best in this valley, I think 13 inches of rain a year, or 13 inches of precipitation, and a lot of that comes in the form of snow. Yeah, my God, last week. Yeah, seriously, <laughs> and it all comes at once. So unless um, the, you know, you're collecting rainfall from your gutter and slowly sluicing it in, you're probably going to have to water your compost every once in a while. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about um, sort of uh, things to look for when you're, you're building a compost pile in terms of the oxygen and the water. Um, temperature also becomes really important. Um, because these microbes are doing a lot of your work, they are they're going to need to have a range of temperatures that they can survive in. Um, when temperatures get down much below 50 degrees, things really slow down in a compost pile. And when they hit freezing, they, they stop. So if you want to be composting year round, it helps to have either a, a dark container in a sunny area or to even bring it inside of a garage, say in front of a window where it could um, get warm and you know be out of those freezing cold temperatures. On the other side of things, if your temperatures get so hot, I'm thinking you know, around 200 degrees, um, you're going to end up killing all your organisms as well. There's a very important sort of middle ground between, say, 50 and 60 degrees, and the high end of things surviving your pile is about 170 degrees. So can you freeze them? Like, I mean, if you have a pile outside, you just let it sit for the winter, and you can just let it, it'll start up again. Yep, that's, that's what happens behind my house. I'll probably mention my compost pile every now and again in this talk, and. I, as far as compost goes, I'm definitely a person of like, do as I say, not as I do. My compost pile is usually fairly unneglected. Um, and during the wintertime, it, it sits in suspended animation. And then as soon as it gets warm out, it just keeps eating here again. I don't do much management of it at all. So, I mean, I don't need to put a tarp over it for the winter? Or would that be helpful? No, you know, the only reason you might want to do that is if, um, if you're in an area of town where that will become a food source for critters which in the middle of winter are going to have a hard time finding other food, then it could become a nuisance source for, you know, whatever stray animals or um, mice, you know, they'll, they'll be, they'll, mice will be psyched by your pile, they'll be living in there, pretty much guaranteed if you have it outside in the wintertime. They're always in my, my, my cat brings mice in weekly from the compost pile in the wintertime. Cat feeder. 
What's that? A catheter? Yeah, your yeah. compost pile is many. It's uh, it. Uh, it one, yeah, I should write that down. It's one more function. Is yeah, it? There's a lot of cats in my neighborhood. So mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, <laughs> well, and that's we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Um, just to try, try to keep from becoming a nuisance ourselves with compost piles. Yes. I uh, accidentally uh, composted in black garbage bags. Mm-hmm. That works pretty well. Turns out. You, you put stuff in a bag and just kind of left uh, it somewhere yeah, by accident. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, that's, <laughs> and uh, worked pretty well. Yeah, w- was it yard waste? Yeah, yard waste and, and some kitchen waste. Sure it's you. You probably got lucky that it was just. It was not completely closed. I'm, I'm guessing the oh, tops yeah, yeah. were not sealed. Right, not sealed. So it wasn't completely without oxygen. But it it's pure laziness. I mean, I've, you would like that. I mean, just <laughs> yeah. Hey, throw it over there. I'll get to it later. Yeah. Do. Yeah. Work do as little as you can to make it happen. Is kind of my motto, especially since my daughter was born. Free time kind of <laughs> disappeared. Um, the one last thing I want to say about temperature is that uh, in an active compost pile, um, a lot of the temperature within the pile is actually coming um, not from the environment outside of it, but from within, and it's the activity of the organisms. When you, um, we'll talk about actually creating a compost pile and the difference between what's called a cold compost pile, which is mine in my backyard, where I just, it sits there, I dump stuff on top of it, it just slowly decomposes, and what's called hot composting, where you actively make a pile all at once that decomposes you know, three feet by three feet by three feet simultaneously. Like yep, something like this would be considered a, a hot composting process. Um, and what happens is that the bacteria start start feeding, they start converting the, the sugars and whatnot into energy and they start getting into that nitrogen and reproducing. And just like we, when we go to a potluck in somebody's kitchen, in one of those small little houses here on the north side, which are great to hang out in, Um, and 12 or 15 of us end up piling into the little kitchen and talking and eating and drinking and having fun, it gets really hot in there because our bodies are producing so much heat that it's actually heating the room. The the heat of the bacteria actually just going through their life cycle, their, their daily respiratory processes, creates an enormous amount of heat in that pile. Um, and is what ultimately in the hottest compost piles, which reach about 170 degrees in the middle of them, it's entirely, um, it's a living process that creates that heat. And that's the heat that we depend on um, when I talk about um, killing weed seeds. Most weed seeds, if you're throwing yard clippings in and you want to kill weed seeds, it needs to get about 160 degrees. You want to kill the nasty pathogens, the bacteria, you know, that comes from our guts, you think about E. coli, things like that. Um, I don't even know if E. coli would, nasty strains would die in the hottest center of a compost pile all the time. But what about daffodil? I mean, or, you know, not daffodils, I mean, uh, some, what are those little, the weeds? The little dandelions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, they I, got I, those rat tail roots. I mean. Yeah, you know, the roots themselves will probably dry out. It, you could kill them off by, you know, drying those out. But the seeds would have to be in the center of a pretty hot pile. So and you don't want to compost. You want to be very careful if you're composting weed seeds in your own backyard compost pile. And when we go over there, I'll, I'll show you kind of why. But only the very center, if you're thinking about a compost pile, it's maybe three feet by three feet by three feet. Only the center, maybe one foot steer, like a basketball size, is really going to get to be 170 degrees. The rest of it, it's kind of like the, the layers of an onion. It goes out, it'll be 170, and then maybe 150, and then 100 and whatever. And the likelihood of all your seeds being right in the center of that pile to die is pretty unlikely. And none of us is as good as Eco Compost is, where their their process is so mechanized, everything gets thoroughly cooked and mixed and whatnot. It has to because it's human waste. Um, but in our backyard piles, almost none of us are, are as picky enough as we should be to try to kill all the seeds. Or the pathogens, for that matter, which is again why. Um, when we talk about what you should and definitely shouldn't try to compost, those, that's usually the reason why we don't put stuff in the pile is that it doesn't kill the bad stuff. Um, and then the, the last thing um, with the, the abiotic components, and it, I'll talk about it a lot today, and it, it becomes, the of all the things in making a compost pile, from a scientific perspective, it's the most important thing uh, to get right to actually make the decomposition process flow. And it's what's called the carbon to nitrogen ratio of your compost pile. Have you all heard of this before? Yes? No, I know you better have heard of this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've already talked about the carbon and the nitrogen. The, the carbon is things like the, um, the straw you might put in there, um, your, um, uh, the shells of nuts. 
Uh, and then of course the nitrogen is the more green leafy matter and if you compost meat there's a heck of a lot of nitrogen in, in meat um, on the very extreme end. But, but there's you a don't certain want to compost meat. Though, What's right? that? You don't want to compost meat. You, people people tend to stay away from it. But foremost, the reason people don't do it is it attracts critters, mm -hmm. um, and it's so 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 full of nitrogen that it's really hard to get it to break down. Um, and that's a great segue into into why this ratio is so important. As I said, these especially the bacteria, they're eating the carbon for energy, and they're using that nitrogen to build up their own organismal bodies and to reproduce and the average and this is totally an average the average bacteria needs um, 30 units of carbon approximately 30 units of carbon for every unit of nitrogen that it wants to to assimilate so it burns through 30 carbons of energy to build whatever body mass it can build with one unit of nitrogen um, and because our whole goal on our compost pile is to make these bacteria happy and make them thrive, we want to give them a pile that has approximately the ratio that, that they perform the best at. If we end up having way more carbon than nitrogen in our pile, it's just like feeding our kid Wonder Bread without giving them any meat or any other protein. Like they might go crazy energy-wise for a little while, but sooner or later they're they're going to suffer. They're not going to be building up muscle tissue in their brains fast enough. So physically, there will be suffering. The same thing with with the bacteria in your pile. If you give them nothing but carbon, they may be able to feed for a while, but they won't have the those amino acids, the nitrogen compounds, to actually reproduce and to rebuild their own bodies just like ours. I mean, organisms at a microscopic level break down as they live, so they need that as well. And if you have, on the other extreme, if you have so much nitrogen in your pile that the ratio, you have much more nitrogen than you should, it's kind of like, you know, I don't know if any of you have tried the Atkins diet, but the late great Dr. Atkins was like, yeah, just eat a lot of protein and fat, you know, bacon, cheese, omelet, three meals a day, and yeah, People can lose weight that way, but um, as far as uh, your energy level goes, it's going to drop off precipitously after a while because you may be eating all that protein, but then it's the carbohydrates, it's the carbon-based compounds that we need to give us sustained energy. The bacteria are the same way. They'll run out of gas. Um, so it's finding that um, that perfect ratio, that 30 to 1 ratio. And in, this, um, in that handout I gave you, there's a, maybe it's on the second or third page. There's a little table, and we can talk about it more as we're, we're talking about actually building the compost pile. But it, it gives you the basic carbon to nitrogen ratio of some fairly common household um, wastes or yard wastes. And um, what a table like that can be helpful with, I mean, you know, I, you probably won't be sitting in your house here in town saying, well, I've got 3,000 pounds of poultry manure to deal with. How do I? fix the ratio but we all have opportunities to get a hold of some of these things from farmers we know or yeah we probably all mow our lawn and want to compost grass clippings and by knowing the carbon and nitrogen ratio of what you're trying to compost you can then figure out well what do I need to do to this to to make it a perfect ratio for those bacteria um, so this says you can <coughs> compost like cardboard and like newspaper and like, like this stuff like you can um, but if you look down so at the bottom of that thing and it doesn't exactly go in ascending or descending order but newsprint for instance it says it's somewhere between 400 and 800 the ratio of carbon nitrogen is between 400 to 1 and 800 to 1 which is way 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 higher than 30 to 1 so you know we definitely would be feeding those bacteria a whole bunch of carbon but not giving them any nitrogen to use so we wouldn't be able to compost that alone. We'd have to add something that was really rich on nitrogen and fairly lean on carbon. And if you look back up the list, poultry manure says it's somewhere between three and 13 to one. So you could take a whole bunch of poultry manure, shred up a whole bunch of newspaper, and if you had your ratio right, you could probably compost those two together. But that's that uh, you know, 400 to 800 to one that the newsprint is, the cardboard is 500 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. There's a reason why you can throw that stuff in a pile in your backyard and it doesn't really ever seem to go away. Um, then the one other, and you have some experience composting cardboard, don't you? Mm -hmm. You want to tell us a little bit about how you do it? 
Uh, well, it keeps evolving because I keep making experiments, but uh, the most recent is I uh, put down compost material in the fall, hay, horse, whatever I can get, mm -hmm. grass clippings, uh, wood chips, and um, run the rototiller to mix it, mm -hmm. and then put cardboard down over that and put pallets on top of it to <laughs> keep it, um, keep the weeds from growing up out of it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in the spring, rototill it again. You so, rototill that, the cardboard that's on top of yeah, the soil? Yeah, yeah, because by the end of, by the spring, it's very friable. Mm -hmm. This goes right in, you know. Well, and that's, um, that sort of cuts to the very heart of um, one of the most important physical things about composting is getting things broken up small enough that those little microscopic organisms can, can work on it. Cardboard by itself, if you lay it down and don't do anything to it, it almost acts as kind of a cap on the soil. You know, you might keep moisture out, and if you stack a whole bunch of cardboard together, it definitely will create an impermeable layer in your compost pile. And newspaper is famous for doing this as well, where somebody will throw, you know, they'll think, oh, well, it'll break down, but you throw half the Sunday edition into your compost pile, and it gets wet, it absolutely will seal off whatever's underneath it from any new moisture, probably from oxygen being able to get through there. Yeah, so um, thin layers. Yes. Thin layers. Uh, yeah, thin layers, and a lot of people, if they use it in their compost pile, they'll shred it. They'll feed newspaper through a shredder, so it makes nice, long, little curly cues, and then that'll break down a lot easier. Well, just sorry to interrupt you on that. Uh, um, just because we do, we recycle our shreddings, mm -hmm. obviously, but... Or is this type of paper too thick, even if it's wet before we're going? No. Because we were start trying to think, like, we try to do it with, like, activities, you know, and, like, because we have so much, you mm -hmm. know, but, well, I mean, you I know, know it's getting recycled, but it sounds yeah. like if you thought this wasn't, because it's not newspaper, but the sh if the shreddings would work? It, it would. Um, again, it's, it's so high in carbon, so mm -hmm. low nitrogen, that it would take you quite a bit, um, if you had some really wet, you know, if you say steamed a whole bunch of bok choy or spinach in your house and that was pretty wet the paper could soak up the moisture and it was a pretty nitrogen rich stuff you're adding it to it would work um but i guess the two reasons why i don't put paper in our compost pile well, i guess the third one is that i don't manage my compost pile that well but the other two reasons are that um uh there we do have good recycling here in town um and with Adequate. most what's that Adequate. <laughs> Okay, add, add it. We, we have it. We have a recycling program. Um, and you just, a lot of times you don't know what's in the paper, um, which um, I was going to talk about it a little bit later, but we may as well talk about it now, that um, anything you put in your compost pile, just because it's going to break down and decompose doesn't mean you want to put it on your garden. Um, papers, these days I think most inks are, are fairly free of heavy metals or other toxins, but... The colored stuff can be nasty. More colored paper. Yeah, color printing. Uh, yeah, and also slick paper. Yeah, from what I understand, um, magazine paper has some stuff you wouldn't want to eat. Serious landfill. Yeah, food. and there, you know, there, are, there are um, biodegradable diapers out there now that I have friends that have composted those. They didn't put it back on their garden. Number one, because there's human waste in there and there are all sorts of bacteria, as I said, probably won't die off in your compost pile. But that those, just because we call something biodegradable, just because a company touts it as biodegradable, it doesn't mean that when it looks like it's disappeared, that it's gone. A lot of them, they break apart and turn into smaller compounds, but they stick around in the soil and they're not always that healthy for us to ingest. So the people I know that, that uh, compost their diapers um, they do seem to break down pretty well, but they spread it out um, around their landscape, under trees and whatnot, as opposed to around their food. You can always just take the bottoms out of the little people's pants. That works too. Yeah, the button flap. I yeah, think yeah. the butt flaps just, are going to come back, I think, in a big hole. way. <laughs> um, great. So, um, <laughs> does anybody have any questions about, about that stuff? I think just so we don't get too used to this sh nice cool shade. We should go um, take a look at some compost bins that are here and we can talk a little bit about making compost out there and then we can come back in here and kind of finish up. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Any questions before we go? Okay, so there, um, we'll kind of go along here and we're getting 
from this end down, I think we get more and more um, technical with the compost stuff. But even before oh, yeah. this style of compost bin, I'd say the very easiest type of, of um, apparatus to hold compost that exists outside of just throwing your stuff on the ground is to make sort of a, a barrel shaped um, structure out of some sort of heavy duty um, wire mesh or fencing. You can imagine using this stuff. It, this probably wouldn't necessarily hold up to maybe three feet deep of compost inside this pea trellis, but the idea being that you just make a hoop out of that fencing, wire it off, and then you fill it up with whether it's your food waste or your yard waste or whatnot, and then as soon as it fills up, all you have to do is undo the wiring, unwrap the fencing, move the empty fence over, and then you can shovel it back in. Because the key with our composting, I, I guess I, well, I'll say it before we move on, that any compost bin that we're using, we want to be able to remove what's in it and um, turn that compost. Because as we talk about actually making compost, it's very important that we are able to, uh, for uh, maybe once every month or two, several times throughout the life of a compost pile, we need to turn the pile. Turning the pile adds oxygen, it allows us to evenly distribute moisture, and the bacteria that are living in the very center of that compost pile, they're gonna deplete all that food source in the center, but because the conditions are less ideal on the outer parts of the compost pile, um, we wanna take what's on the outside and make it the inside so the bacteria can eat that and how take what's on the inside from the outside. How often do you recommend turning the pile? Well, if you're doing what we were calling hot composting, um, you can kind of measure it by the temperature. If you plunge your hand into the center and it no longer feels fairly warm to you, it's a good time to turn it. And usually, given the conditions that we have around here, maybe that'd be a, between a month and two months if it's, you know, if everything's going right. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, that the cold composting that I was talking about, just sort of piling in one place and letting decomposition very, very, very slowly work from the bottom on up. You can just kind of sit around and wait until it looks like soil at the bottom. Um, cold composting, the difficulty, uh, the one thing I didn't mention is that, yeah, it's, it sure doesn't require a whole lot of energy. You don't even have to build a bin for that matter. But it's really hard to get that good compost off the bottom without ending up with some of the pretty much undecomposed food off the top making it in your garden as well. Whereas if you're doing it in a bin like this where you're constantly turning it and making the inside, the outside, and the outside, and the inside, then it's pretty easy to get it all to turn back into soil. Um, the, I'd say the next, next step up the technical ladder of compost piles are bins that are like this and actually um, this is more complicated than, than a lot of them that you see around town um, where people will just take some pallets from grocery stores and whatnot and just put one on each side and one on the back and they'll screw them together and the slats on the sides keep most of the, the food and whatnot in but the, the gaps in between them allow oxygen to move in and out and allow things just to breathe. Where um, can you get free pallets? You know, there are a lot of stores. Some of the stores around here <coughs> send all their pallets back. Um, you know, like the produce stores tend to ship all their pallets back to their distributors. But there are some other stores, and there are some shipping places out. If you head out, um, like if you go to Scott Street, like you're going to the, the dump, but instead of heading straight north, you kind of take a left, like you're heading out toward Reserve. And there are a couple companies that, that do a lot of freight. Um, uh, receiving and some of those places they get stuff on pallets special orders and whatnot and the pallets don't go back and they just have piles of them you could probably call around to some of the shipping places what about like Pacific Recycling or something? you know I don't know um, they they may very well um, there's a company called Johnson Brothers here in town that recycles pallets I think they repair and recycle them I don't know if they sell them no. A big sign that says, you know, we won't sell. Yeah, them. yeah, they stay sell away it. from our pallets. Yeah, pallets. yeah. Um, but I bet, yeah. I bet if you called around, um, you could, you could talk to stores. And sometimes Home Resource has a bunch of pallets. They, they come and they go, and they like to keep some of them there. I know, but I'll bet if they had a big stack, one of the guys that works there would either part with a couple or sell you a couple really cheap. Yeah. Um, oh, it's really easy. I mean, I do it. Uh, you just particularly on Sunday weekend. Just drive around in lots of places like you say they get stuff, they just leave the pallets out. Yeah. They're obvious. Yeah, you just want to make sure anything that's sitting behind a store, you just want to make sure that it's not sitting there waiting to be picked up. Especially those the blue pallets you might mm. see around. The those are fairly expensive and they'll 
that they end up getting charged that they lose those but um there, there, there. I bet there are lots of sources of pallets around town. Um, and if you notice, this, there are three um, compartments in this one. And this first one has obviously what looks like, like maybe last night's trimmings or whatnot from dinner. Um, if you have a three bin system, generally the idea. Are you throwing weeds in here or those? Lettuce. So, oh yeah, it's, that is lettuce. Just lettuce a little bit bolted, right? huh? Yes. Yeah, you can, you can yeah. come. You can come show us how stuff goes into the first bin. Yeah, show us the technique. This uh, is actually the first bin. Oh, so that's the first one I'm standing on the wrong oh, end. Oh, you're eh? fine. No, it's, um, I, I don't, the observation of the, the moving that way sometimes isn't, isn't as, as um, consistent as we'd like, but. Yeah, I think we used all the good organic matter yeah. that was in this one, and yeah, we're so starting to build that one. Like, we're going to use the middle one now. Yeah. So we'll finish the whole thing. But this was the starting. You know, we have some parties and stuff. And people just throw stuff wherever they Yeah, people from yeah. all over the neighborhood is, come and come. Oh, yeah, really look at that. Like where we're <laughs> yeah. So this is this is what we're looking at in the first bin of these kinds of things. And this is absolutely, this This is what, um, this is what people in the, the soil science world technically call the, the newly dead. And what we're working on in, um, in composting is working our way down to newly dead. To really dead to really really dead to the really 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 dead which is what you end up putting in your garden um, and the idea with having a three chamber setup like this is that you can for quite a while fill up the the first chamber until it's almost full and then because as we said we want to to turn it mix it all together if we if we decide if we looked at this and said eh, it looks like there's a lot of food waste here and there is quite a bit the coffee grounds and other things it might need a little bit more carbon so we may take a little bit of straw mix it in there and then when we shovel it over here we into bin number two we can make sure it gets nicely mixed and that mixing again it aerates it it just makes everything as homogeneous as possible it, it breaks up the larger pieces into smaller ones um, and by taking it and scooping it out of here and tossing this one we just kind of fluff the whole pile as well um, another great reason to have three bins not all of us have enough space i don't have enough space my, behind my house to do this which is again why my compost pile work looks the way it does but to get the the most ideal uh, decomposition conditions most people say a good rule of thumb is having about a three foot by three foot by three foot cube of composting stuff that way you have enough mass that holds temperature for a decent amount of time it holds moisture inside where you don't have to water it all the time um, but it's not so large the very center of it can't get oxygen and most of us don't produce this much food waste in a week so this allows us to fill this up maybe in a family of four or whatnot this will take you a month and a half or two months who knows to fill up and then you move it into this bin well that just happens to work out really well timing wise to when hopefully if we built it right this pile got hot when we moved it it cooked down for one or two months and as soon as this one's full this one should be kind of cooling down and we can go ahead and shovel this one into the last bin by mixing it one more time or hopefully getting it so that when it's done cooking down in here it's pretty much ready to go out and then that moves here and this frees this up again and that works out really well if you do produce a lot of food waste and you are planning on um, using your finished compost say in your garden where you don't want to have banana peels popping out or things that just aren't broken down at all which can be a problem if you have like this single barrel composting system where if you want everything to be broken down by the time it comes out you got to stop putting stuff in for a while um, so you know, anybody have any questions about this style I'm thinking about your hoop why not just turn the hoop on its side and roll it across the yard if you put ends on it, I bet you could. Otherwise, if you didn't have a, a top or a bottom unless it was really long, you'd probably be rolling it and your stuff would be probably kind of spilling out as you went. a bad thing? <laughs> <laughs> it depends on what your other half in the house decides should or shouldn't be in the yard, I suppose. I don't think I'd get away with it. My dog would probably eat everything out of the yard. I, I use uh, compost pile places uh, for planting beds mm -hmm. because they're really sterile by the time uh, you get all the compost off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's amazing how it no weeds. Yeah, you know a book called Lasagna Gardening by any chance? It, it sounds vaguely familiar, but I don't. Uh, the her idea is that you don't 
do any of this. Mm -hmm. You go out and you get your uh, chopped up leaves or whatever, and you pile it in, in layers like lasagna, mm -hmm. and uh, leave it. Hmm. I'll bet, I'll bet it works really well in California. No, no, she's got, uh, it, it's really a highly technical thing. She was hmm. doing this in northern New York. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, it sounds, I mean, it sounds interesting, and I'll bet if you did the layering right, it would insulate, keep things warmer later into the season. Um, I know a lot, a lot of stuff is done that way, though. People do it in areas where they don't have as much of a frozen period as we do, because our decomposition just kind of midway through the mid to late fall. But it sounds interesting, though. My, my cardboard thing keeps it warmer, I think. Oh, I'll bet. The, no, I'm uh, sure it does. Uh, there's no snow collects on my cardboard thing. Anyway. So this, as far as I know, is just a plastic tub of manure. Um, but something like this uh, would, uh, a container such as this would work really well if you wanted to do um, vermicomposting, worm composting, um, whether inside or outside. The, the one catch with worm composting is that a lot of times you end up with, with fluid at the bottom and you need to drill some holes in it to drain it. Um, yet you don't want to holes too big. If you do drill big holes, you want to put mesh over the bottom so your worms don't all escape. So if you don't keep the conditions perfect, they'll flee for for more enjoyable conditions. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to go for the worm composting. Worm composting requires an, um, a surprising amount of time just in terms of keeping them alive. I mean, they're living organisms and if you go away on vacation for a couple weeks and don't water or feed them, then they all die and it's just kind of sad. Oakland. Where they crawl, where they crawl in. The city of Oakland will sell you uh, for twenty-six dollars a uh, worm composting thing with the worms. Yeah. And instruction manual, and there's some things that you you really just can't feed them. You can make them sick. You gonna save any berries wow. for anybody else? Do you know anything about this? Uh -huh. You know what I know is that um, we are going to year ago, and um, during the cleanup this year, I opened it. And I think those are the ones that are supposed to break down. Yeah, these are the ones that are supposed to break down. But it's like, I don't even know. Yeah, it's just not really what we need. This actually takes more effort. Yeah, oh yeah. You know, they were like, just throw it in there. Yeah. And that's what. UV sensitive. Right, I think a lot of it takes yeah. takes yeah. sun That's why it exposure. Like, it was like silk to there with this. So this this kind of composting bin, um, this is on the, the higher end of technical apparatus. Um, you can probably spend more money on something like this than you probably could on a lot of things in your house. And I I've known people. I've never owned anything like these. Um, I've heard a lot of mixed reviews. Um, but wait, I'm sorry. What's your name? Pilot. Uh, I was just saying that um, it can take a decent amount of work to operate something like this, and they're not all created equal. You'll see some in the stores. Probably the more expensive ones, maybe engineered, built more soundly, work better. But um, I mean, the first thing I notice with this is that it's got a lid. That yeah, it seems like um, it does. It does make sense that it's got these little slits, and you can kind of turn it and allow it to kind of micromanage the, the humidity, keep moisture in and whatnot. But the more we enclose something, the more we have to do the watering ourselves. I mean, yeah, it'll conserve moisture in an arid place, but unless we take the lid off, it's not going to get rained on. Um, and yeah, it's black, um, therefore it's going to soak up solar radiation, it's going to keep things warm. There are probably are circumstances where this could actually get too hot for you. Um, and it, I'm sure there, there are certain circumstances, maybe there are, God, the neighborhood I grew up in, we weren't allowed to have compost piles. But there are probably areas where you need to have something like this because the neighbors don't want to see the compost piles. Um, a, a problem with me, though, is if things are out of sight, they get out of mind. Um, the freezer in my garage is still full of stuff that I put up last year because I don't think about it. And if I hide my compost in here, I may be less likely to turn it. Um, and it, same thing with like a barrel kind of composter. Um, if you want this to be absolutely finished, you have to at some point stop putting stuff into it. Um, although, you know, who knows, maybe this would be a great thing to start with this, put all your food into it, <coughs> then move it into bin number one, and it has to have two bins. How does that work? Does it have a spinner mechanism? Or? Nope. You just dig it 
out of the bottom. You just dig it out that door at the bottom, or it looks like you could probably just go like this, rotate it, and shovel it around, and then shovel it back into it. Oh, it's um, not an actual barrel. No, no, it looks it looks almost more like a doghouse, but. Um, but I, I'm not bad mouthing them. It just they're 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 the drawbacks of bees as well. Yeah. Uh, but it does. It looks a lot cleaner than that. And there probably are places. I don't know if in Missoula. I'm sure, there's some gated communities around here that wouldn't let you have anything with this. But um, so it does. That neatness does help. Yeah. That's we're we're in a neighborhood, so that's why too. It's just mm -hmm. more conducive to everybody. Totally. Yeah, yeah you could. <laughs> <laughs> Roll your barrel down the street, just like you said. And mix it as you move. <laughs> Make the fossil fuels all worthwhile. Um, so that's, I mean, that's kind of the, the long and the short of the actual um, uh, bins themselves. And you can go online, and there there are plans for you know, millions of different styles. Um, and I think the only thing that you, you want to look at your site if you're in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Choose something that's appropriate for you and your neighbors. If you have it in the alley as opposed to in a fenced area, you very well will probably want to have a lid on your compost bin to keep the dogs out mm -hmm. or hungry cats. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the wire on this is great. It's, it seems heavy enough that it doesn't kind of pooch out the sides. Um, and it'll put up with a, a shovel or two getting bumped into it. But you go any lighter than that, you'll probably be tearing the sides. Uh, it wouldn't hold up for, for very long. So. I was uh, was told, and I believe a lot of this is just belief, right? Uh, that putting twigs and sticks down mm -hmm. to start with is a good idea for aeration. Yep, just like um, people put coarser aggregate in a um, you know a potted plant or whatnot, um, that it does it lifts things up off the ground. It does give good aeration. It does allow for a different type of drainage as opposed to having stuff just sitting right on on wet hard soil. So that's. That's definitely you get through a good those way nasty to go about it. ornamental bushes that are using up valuable space. Exactly, just cut them, <laughs> right, yeah. cut that mock orange down and right. line your compost pile. You can also use dried corn stalks. You can use a lot of different things. Um, and I've known some people that have that'll put down a pallet on the bottom mm -hmm. to build around. The only trouble with that is sometimes shoveling out your if you depending on how you orient the bottom boards. Every time you go in, you'll shout out a couple curse words because your shovel gets like buried underneath the board and you can't pry up so it, it does make it hard to get the last of the drags out of there but um, but when sticks do the same thing kind of interfere like the they stick around and they end up in your compost yeah yeah, I, yeah it's probably there's no perfect solution and it's a great point yeah. that some of the um some of the pallet material i'm sure has treated wood or nasty paint like those blue pallets i'm sure that blue paint doesn't stick to those for no reason at all i'm sure it's got some <laughs> something in it that'll stick your ribs. Um, yeah, exactly. Wood chips are tricky. For composting? Oh. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that's what um, Eco Compost does. They use, um, they take your yard waste, they shred it, and they feed it through with all that um, the composted sewage material. And the decomposition process sort of eats away the outside of the wood chips, and they just get smaller. Then they put them back in and they get smaller again. That's like right. you, if you look at Eco Compost, it actually looks like somebody added really fine wood chips to compost or topsoil. And that's just that those chips were much larger at one time. They just slowly get eaten down by the bacteria and fungi and whatnot during the decomposition. So they're just doing like a really high carbon thing and a really high nitrogen thing. Yeah, I mean, they, and they're, that stuff coming out of the sewage sludge, I bet the carbon and nitrogen is three to one, five to one. I don't know for sure, but. Um, it's hot and and just there's really nasty stuff that comes out of our, our waste stream um, not just pathogens but also I mean you know and they claim that there's no antibiotic residue that comes through very little trace heavy metals but it's hard to it's hard to know just because they're pretty expensive tests and I think they're running them all the time and we as a species do not do a great job about policing what we put into our bodies we, we even even those of us who really like organic food seem to just for some reason put a whole bunch of trash into our bodies as well. Um, Western medication is really bad. Caffeine's a really bad pollutant that goes through our, our sewer system. Um, but, you know, supposedly the composting process either removes or destroys a lot of that stuff. I guess I don't know what to believe, but... Well, it's Stamets says he can turn uh, diesel fuel into compost. Really? Yeah, with oyster mushrooms. 
Huh. I've heard some crazy yeah. stuff. Yeah. Paul Stanley. Who is it? What's, is he the guy that runs Nico? I don't know. He's a sort of psychological guru person, but he's a mycologist. Huh. Great books. Mycelium oh, running. Okay. Beautiful book. It'd be great if you could break down stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. It'd be great if you could work on breaking down plastic. Like well, straight up normal plastic. There was styrofoam a, would be a good one too. They had an experiment uh, that he describes um, where uh, three of them had uh, piles of diesel waste from something. And um, people tried doing various things, you know, inoculating bacteria and so forth in the other piles. It didn't work. But his mushrooms uh, not only did uh, the mushrooms reduce the bio the hydrocarbons in there, right? Break them down. They're also really edible. Hmm. I don't know if I'd be eating stuff that's breaking down that kind of stuff. No, it, but, uh, <laughs> it, you know, it, uh, yeah. As you were saying about call, what call me uh, a non call me a non-believer. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 but it's great though if that kind of stuff can break those compounds down. I mean, we need more and more of that kind of research being done. So that's uh, that's the long and the short of the composting apparatuses. Um, and going through this, we kind of talked about the actual construction of a compost pile. Do you want to do you want to talk a little bit more about that, or how do you how do you feel about actually whether we were talking about constructing a pile in place, like either layering and whatnot? Do you want to go into that at all, or do you want to talk more about what what can we compost, what shouldn't we, and what's going wrong? What, why does my pile look like? Uh, was, yeah. no. That'd be great. Go into that as, as opposed to actual. Yeah. Okay. And, and when we're done, if there's somebody that has a specific question about how do I compost A, B, or C, we can talk about that afterwards. Um, do you want to go back up in the tree? Yeah, let's do that. It sounds, <laughs> sounds not so hot. So I guess the one, the one thing that I, I didn't want to forget um, just about making the compost is that. Um, as we, as you think about your carbon to nitrogen ratio, um, and sort of how to get it to that right mixture, it always helps me to have one of those general rules of thumb of like, well, what do I at home usually compost? For me, I'm usually composting my food waste out of the, the kitchen, and you know, we keep a bucket. It's a little bit smaller than this. It's a two-gallon bucket on our um, on our counter, and it has a lid. It should be a pretty tight-fitting lid, or else your fruit fly breeding project will get out of control and they'll never leave your kitchen. Um, but our, our bucket, usually it fills up about two thirds of the way and then it goes out. And um, that carbon to nitrogen uh, ratio, it's, it's, a, it's a by weight thing. Um, so my bucket, when, it, when it's full, when I take it out, it usually is about five pounds, give or take. So five pounds of food waste. And my food waste, I guess, is about 15 to one carbon to nitrogen. So that means I need to bump up the carbon. And I have a decent supply of straw bales at work, and every once in a while I grab a half of a broken bale and bring it home. And for me, I've kind of weighed it out, and I know that for every five pounds of my food at 15 to one carbon and nitrogen, I need to add a pound of straw, which I estimated about 100 to one. And it's just a little math problem you have to do to figure out your ratios, but, um, and a pound of straw works out nicely to be about an inch of straw. And as you guys demonstrated, separating that one bale into two, it, it flakes off in nice little shingles. So for me, I know that if I take the bucket out and it's full, I need to break off about an inch thick shingle of straw. And then I just break it up because using it as a shingle, it makes a great seat because it props you up, but it's really thick. It's hard. You need to break it up and fluff it just like you'd be making bedding for an animal. And by doing that and then pouring your food waste on top and maybe sprinkling a little bit more just to, to keep any food odors down, um, I know that I'm as I'm building that compost pile in the backyard, I'm giving myself the ratio that I'm going to need in the long run. Instead of worrying about fixing it later and having to estimate boy, how many buckets did I put in there, how much straw is that, um, I try to keep my ratio uh, somewhat correct as I'm building the pile throughout a month or two. I use lawn clippings because mm -hmm. it's readily available. And uh, what I I use a uh, food uh, animal food storage, pet food storage thing. Mm -hmm. that it's got a nice clasp on it and a rubber seal, which is nice, mm -hmm. next to the sink. And uh, so I spread that on top of the pile, and I just bury it with uh, lawn clippings. 
which I keep in a separate pile under a tarp. Mm-hmm. Nice, and that works well for you? Yeah, long clippings can compost really well. The amazing thing with most yard waste is how it changes over time. When you clip your grass in the springtime and it's nice and fleshy and green, your carbon and nitrogen ratio could be less than 20 to 1. It could be kind of hot. Um, but if you let that pile sit out for a while, and I think we've all done that, you know, you mow the lawn, you leave some piles out, and you walk past it in the, the, the summer, and you can feel heat coming off of it. It's turning brown, and you smell that ammonia smell. It's off-gassing a lot of the nitrogen in it in the form of ammonia. And as that pile is turning brown, very quickly your carbon and nitrogen ratio is climbing. You're losing nitrogen. It goes from 20 to 1 or less up to maybe 50 to 1. Really, really, really dry um, grass clippings can be as high as 70 or 80 to 1, depending on what kind of grass you have. Um, and the same goes for if you have old hay. You mentioned old hay. Um, when it's freshly cut and still green, it's probably closer to 30 to 1. But when it gets a lot drier, it probably 60, 70 probably starting to approach straw, which, you know, is 100 or 150 to 1. Um, the one thing to mention about uh, hay, everybody know the difference between hay and straw? No. Straw, is, straw is the stalks of a grain that's been harvested, so there, there really shouldn't be anything in there but sort of hollow tube stalks, whereas, so that's straw, and then hay is just, um, mostly grasses and other things out in fields that are just mowed um, seed heads or not. And very likely if you start composting with hay, um, I mean the protein content that's higher, so that's why we feed hay to animals, but all those seeds are not likely gonna die in your compost pile and you very well could be sprouting a pasture in your garden. So you wanna do straw, not hay? Straw is preferable to hay. Um, if you are really good at your composting and you mix it a lot and get it hot, or if you don't mind pulling a few weeds, usually it'll be grassy weeds, which don't always tend to be as bad in, in gardens to deal with. Um, but you're, you're better off using straw. And around here, if you buy straw at, say, Ace Hardware or um, Senex up on reserve, uh, quality supply, um, most of that shouldn't be treated. But you have to be careful if you're getting straw or hay, especially dryland hay in Montana um, and dryland straw, because a lot of those areas um, it's treated with herbicides to keep unwanted weeds down and the last thing you want to do is put a herbicide that has a long lifespan in your compost pile. You could put it in your garden and say, well, God, I wonder why nothing is germinating. It's because there's uh, a chemical that prevents seed germination that you've then added to your soil. Some of those things have take years to break down. I don't know any names of them, but you want to be really careful. You're, you're best off getting either from a, a farmer you really trust, a rancher you really trust, or getting them from a, a store where they're selling it with the idea that you're going to mulch your garden with it. Um, that stuff, it's, it's unlikely you're going to get in anything that would be harmful to you, but it definitely could be harmful to your garden. Yeah, it would be a, a shame. The way I use, uh, is I have lots of farmers around me, lots of hay, so there's always a few bales there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I use it with the cardboard mulch mm -hmm. that uh, solves that weed problem. Yeah, they probably have a chance to start germinating and then it just kills them off or it smothers them. It's a good idea. Um, so I guess, let's see, well what, before we get into what can go wrong, let's just kind of finish up on what you can compost and what we really shouldn't compost. Um, anything really that was ever alive or that was produced by anything alive? which includes waste, you know, manures and whatnot, can compost. Um, anything from wood chips to, to manures to um, poultry feathers, you know, you name it. If, it. if it has an organic origin, it'll, it'll decompose. Um, but as we said before, not everything that can be composted should be composted and put on your garden, um, which is why we keep human wastes for sure out of anything that's going to go near food. And really human waste decomposition should be handled by professional people. Um, because if you're not careful and you put those kinds of pathogens in a pile and you heat it up just warm enough, say 120 degrees where they really thrive but you don't kill them off, you can end up really causing yourself a whole bunch of problems. Um, and dog. like we have, uh, salmonella from uh, um, yeah. salad. And yeah, I think a lot of that came from untreated hog lagoon yeah. sewage but um, uh, other manures to stay away from 
really most domestic wastes, um, cat, uh, cat feces, you really shouldn't compost, especially if you have small kids or um, there's anybody mm -hmm. pregnant around because there's a, um, some, I don't know if it's a parasite, I can't remember Parasites, what it is. Toxoplasmosis. To toxoplasmosis. Um, uh, you can end up with problems with that. Um, dog uh, feces, you can compost, but it tends to be really, really high in sodium because dog foods tend to be pretty high mm -hmm. in sodium and just their, their bodies tend to accumulate it and excrete it. Um, so you'll end up with salinity problems in your soil. Um, there are also a lot of um, chemicals that go into really cheap dog and cat food that you don't want to add in your soil. Uh, they also have other viruses and pathogens. It's a good idea to buy a lot of that. Our dog, dog poop we just bag and throw away. Or you can send it to Eco because again it gets hot enough there. Um, but um, uh, meats and whatnot, um, oily substances, you know, salad dressing, it usually ends up causing more of a mess than is good. It can compost, but in your backyard compost piles, it'll attract critters um, and usually end up, if anything else, it'll it'll grow molds and other nasty stuff that'll compete with your, your good bacteria. So anything that's really oily, um, you're better off throwing So do you away. not want to compost moldy food? You can compost moldy food. Um, uh, I'm thinking more like taking that half a gallon of rancid olive oil and throwing it on there um, as causing you know nasty problems. But moldy food is fine. That shouldn't cause any trouble. What about bread? <coughs> I've never had a problem with bread, but again, bread when it gets stale and hard, it can. If you throw in a bunch of pieces of bread, it can cause a cap. It can kind of seal off, and you know they're really fluffy breads. It compresses yeah. it almost like a, a paper or a cardboard. So if you're going to do it, um, you could shred it up or whatnot, um, or feed it to your chickens. Put it in the freezer and feed it to the chickens, I guess. But it, it will compost. Um, do we have any other compounds that you would be curious about? Um, some things, people claim that, that meat and oily substances can cause your pile to get so hot that it can spontaneously combust. I know one person who spontaneously combusted their compost pile, or so they said. They, they It caught on fire and they thought it was spontaneous combustion. And it was because he was using some thinned out linseed oil, um, which is one of those things that says on the, the side, do not leave brushes or rags laying around. And he had it in the jar and his wife thought that it was just cooking oil and pour it on top of the pile. There was a bunch of straw on the top and it somehow they think spontaneous and combust. Even either that or somebody threw a cigarette in there. But um, I would not pour things like that on there because I guess it's always awesome. Um, and again, just in terms of paper, anything that may possibly have um, treated substances on it, um, uh, metals in the inks or whatnot, just really think about how that very quickly accumulates in the soil. You break down 15 pounds of uh, paper that's got a, a, um, a nasty ink. Um, you know, you make a small amount of compost, you put that next to a plant, it absorbs it possibly, and then your kids end up eating it. Just it's, it's a better idea if you're really not sure about something to send it to recycling or to throw it away. But new, you send newspapers or? You can do it. Um, you know, I, I would, I like, you know, straw as opposed to, to newsprint. I, I don't really know what goes into newsprint ink these days. I'm sure it's healthier than it used to be, but again. It's mostly made yeah. in soybeans. The ink is? Hmm. So you just eat our newspapers be. straight up, huh? <laughs> Some papers are probably black, better yeah. to eat than they are to read these days. Um, so the last of the things that I have planned to talk about are just kind of what can go wrong. Um, and the, the two main problems that I hear most people talk about is um, the pile smells. That's usually what people have problems with. And a smelly pile tends to be two things. Either the pile is too wet so that it's, um, it just creates a, a, a shield where either oxygen can't get in and it gets to what we call an anaerobic condition where um, maybe it smells sulfury or whatnot and there are different bacteria that thrive in anaerobic conditions without oxygen. Um, so if you have a sulfury smell, it's definitely too wet. Um, and if it's too wet, um, the bacteria just can't do what they want to do uh, in that situation. So 
the best thing to do is to either if it's say getting water by your sprinklers every day point them so it's not watering them every day if you're not in missoula which is a very arid area and you someplace like seattle where it just rains cats and dogs all the time maybe you do need one of those things that's got a lid on it and you do need to prevent moisture um, the other reason that it could smell is that you're way too high in nitrogen and just like that grass clipping pile that off gases that ammonia smell anything anytime that we have a whole bunch of nitrogen in a pile sitting there without enough carbon for those bacteria to be getting energy they won't be able to use all that the nitrogen compounds and it'll end up off gassing uh, in certain compounds and usually that's what people complain about uh, well you know, the piles that are too wet will probably make your neighbor just about as mad as a pile that's way too high on nitrogen um, and in that case, what you need to do is pull the pile apart and just mix it, start mixing in more, more carbon source. Um, and you know, even if your, your is ratio, organic material, yeah, something like go buy a bale of straw at, at Ace Hardware or Cenex or, or some shredded newspaper. Sawdust is one of the most absorptive substances and it's extremely high in carbon. In this chart, it says it's somewhere between 400 and 800 to one. Um, you want to be very careful using sawdust. Again, it's one of those things that can form a cap if you're not careful because it compresses when it's wet. And you very, very quickly can go over um, adding 800 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio to something. A couple cups could push you way past where you need to be. So you just want to be really careful with it. If you're in an emergency situation and the neighbors are having a wedding next door and you just need to get rid of the smell, <laughs> go down the street to your friend who has a wood shop and dump shavings on it and nobody will smell a thing and then you just need to fix your ratio so sell cedar uh, things on there on third speed mm -hmm. cedar chips yeah you could you could work. use some of that just mulch the top of it for the time being and, uh, um, in the summertime and pigs are not the cleanest animals in the world they kind of go to the bathroom wherever they please which includes the mud and we would get very anaerobic soil in the pens and just by breaking up a couple bales of straw and spreading it around it sucks up that moisture it very quickly causes a bacterial bloom which starts breaking down the compounds and immobilizing that nitrogen um, and it's amazing you spread a couple bales and pigs start smelling like roses before you know it so the other the other side of um, having a stinky pile is having a cold lifeless pile and um, it happens to people a lot as well and the two reasons that that happens uh, is the exact opposite of having a stinky pile. If it's cold and, and lifeless, it's either not wet enough. If it's absolutely dry in the middle of the summer and it's not getting any moisture, um, hosing it down a little bit will do wonders. It's just like, I don't know how many of you have ever worked around outhouses, but in Montana, outhouses can fill up very quickly because it's so dry, stuff doesn't break down there. But all you gotta do is hose it down and in the course of the summer, the vast majority of what's in, like a permanent dugout, I'm talking like the old school moon cutting the door kind of outhouse, you can hose it down and very quickly that pile disappears because it just, it gets so dry that nothing can live to break it down. Um, the other... Do you have a lot of experience with rustic outhouses? One, one or two. <laughs> Paul Brady does it like that. Really classy two-seater outhouse called the Rumble Seat. Um, <laughs> well, you know the, the, relative, the difference between a red corn cob and a white corn cob then? I don't know. Well... You use a red corn cob and then a white corn cob to see if you need another red corn cob. I don't get it. <laughs> this is real. This is from my childhood. <laughs> there you go to the outhouse and then there, there are bins of, and a lot of the corn cobs are red. Uh, so you, um, you have to have some white ones too. We can explain that joke when the camera's turned no, off. No, it's real. I mean, this is, this is oh. anthropology. Uh, it's no, it is. It's, um... Do you call us that time? We can discuss it in the question segment. <laughs> a, lot, a lot better than the Sears catalog. <laughs> way over it. Yeah, that glossy newsprint. Yeah, um, terrible. So, aside from being too dry, um, your carbon to nitrogen ratio could be way too high. So you have way too much carbon, way too much white bread, and not enough nitrogen. Um, so then you just need to, if, if your pile, if you're constantly trying to compost dry grass or whatnot, maybe you'll have to go find llama manure from the, the mud llama manure sale and inoculate it with that and get some, get some more nitrogen in. Or somebody down the street who has 
a horse where you can get even higher nitrogen because the llama manure is, is fairly composted, isn't it? When it comes, or is it is it raw? Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, but then you know raw manure will be even lower in carbon and higher in nitrogen. You can mix that in with your dry grass, and that will help it break down. And it'll that the the fresh manure is teeming with with organisms. It'll just inoculate that pile like nobody's business. So those are the big, anybody else have any, hear, know any complaints about like, oh, this pile did this, or it gave me hives or something? Um, <laughs> well, I know not to uh, leave an <laughs> uncovered like, pile of lawn clippings. What is that? Oh, they, it, the, when they get wet, mm -hmm. they just turn into that thing. It turns into a kind of very viscous mud that you can't uh, yeah. do much of anything with. It's a weird, like, greenish sort of mud yeah, at the bottom. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. creepy. And it just doesn't mix well. Yeah, it doesn't at all. Um, yeah, once clippings are old and then they get wet, yeah, it almost just kind of like turns into some like strange other yeah, substance. To work. So, base, I mean, can compost, like you're saying, go bad and it means that the organisms don't thrive or, you know, the bacteria doesn't do what it's supposed to do? Is it always savable? Is it always, it, does it go bad? Like, do you ever have to throw your compost out? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, the only reason you have to throw it out is if some, if um, somebody dumped chemicals in there. Okay. Um, it, talking about yard waste, if um, if there was something like uh, Roundup, it, as much bad press as Roundup gets, mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's a synthetic uh, herbicide, but it has a very short half-life in the environment. It usually breaks down almost completely in one to two That's months. That's the main ingredient. The, the, they keep putting other stuff in there, and it, Roundup is never... Gly gly glyphosate, this, yeah, is, it breaks down quickly. They, they, you have to look at other things, just like you know some compounds it's in terms of certified mm -hmm. organics. Some substances are allowed, but then companies use um, synergists or other compounds that make it work more, and those are not allowed by organics. You just got to be careful. Yeah. You know, don't just buy something because of a name brand. But there are other herbicides that can last for years, and if it's being sprayed on a yard, they're being sprayed on trees. You have to be really careful about 24D. that. 2,4-D. 2,4-D sticks around a long time. Um, WD-40? WD-40 probably shouldn't go in a compost. <laughs> Unless you get into some of the mushrooms that he was talking about earlier. <laughs> um, I haven't but, seen them. Oh, no, but I, if you I, don't I, use those materials, you know what I mean? If like, yeah. you don't spray, you don't, you know... It shouldn't go bad. You it really can't shouldn't. really like, kill your compost, unless the worms get out, like you said. Yeah, you know, if, you're, if your worms bamboos on you. I guess it's, very, it's, it's possible that in a, a very unique situation, right. you could end up with some sort of a... Salt. Uh, yeah, if, if it's salt way, way too salty, if it's way too sal saline. But can you still save it? If that okay. probably not, because okay. um, most of the time, if, if something like soy or anything else is really, really, really salty, it needs to be leached out unless you want to sit there and water your pile, and because then that salt's just going to go somewhere else. Right. In your yard. What do worms do during the winter? Do they die? They, I think, a lot of them burrow down, down far enough that they kind of hang out below the frost line. Some of them probably hibernate. I, I uh, vermiculture, I don't really know much about. So worms are a good sign of a healthy, healthy worms soil. Worms don't tend to hang out in soil if it's not if it, if, if it's not fairly healthy. Good. Um, so we're we're at we're at about the end of the time. I just wanted to, to make a pitch for this book. I, I don't get any money from the publishers at all, but I, I do I do believe that this is it's my favorite composting book. It's the um, Rodale book of compost, and the Rodale Institute does great stuff. They they do very sound science and make it digestible for us mere mortals. They just want to actually use it for something. Um, it's got a lot of good tips on composting your yard waste, your food waste, your livestock manure and whatnot. Um, you can pass it on to the library on campus. But I'm uh, uh, putting ashes in compost. Oh yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, ashes um, should generally, I, I don't think it's a good idea to put most ashes in compost because again especially coal ash because it, it um, uh, sulfur lead and a few other heavy metals um, uh, very easily accumulate and you're taking a fairly large mass of a substance cooking it down to something very small toxins accumulate very very quickly so that's thank you for mentioning what that what about um, like wood from a smoker that's pretty much ash but it's wood well, I use wood could. ash deliberately uh, when to add to soil, to add potassium, add potassium and potassium. Um, um, yeah, it's it, you definitely if you have an imbalance of nutrients, you can use it. You just want again, you want to make sure where it's coming from. If it's a commercial thing, like that that whatever they call it, cowboy charcoal or whatever, 
Um, and especially any charcoal briquettes that are coming out of your grill, I wouldn't use those. Anything that's been um, uh, processed, fire. industrially processed, I just worry about what's coming out of it. But wood ash itself can be a great source of potassium and whatnot. If you so you cut the tree down in the, the Lolo National Forest and you chop it up yourself, you, you could get some valuable stuff out of it. And wood, uh, wooded areas tend to be acid, mm -hmm. and so uh, wood ash brings them more into balance. That's what I was told. That's why you, then you test it. Mm -hmm. And also there's putting other particulates uh, like uh, sand and small gravel into your compost. Just to let it drain better? Uh, let it drain better and then uh, if you have clay soils, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about when I was doing this in California a few years ago, um, it really helps with the clay soils if I'll there's bet. more sand. I'll bet. Yeah, with raised beds, you can actually amend your soil. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it on a much larger scale, you're kind of stuck with the soil you got. But with raised beds, you can really micromanage stuff pretty well. Well, does anybody have any other other questions? I am happy to, to give you my email address as well if you come up with questions. And it'll be the email address that I check regularly here as opposed to my I university to one. Um, yes. Do you have a way to get other family members to chop up the melon rinds? They put them Aside the from bribery, uh, I don't know. I've tried it pretty much everything. Um, you know, the the only thing that I've heard of people doing is um, buying, going to a garage sale, buying a large used Cuisinart, and just taking <laughs> rinds and stuff, having that thing dedicated as the compost Cuisinart. Turn it on, feed your food waste through there, so then it really chops stuff up nicely. If you can find one for like ten do you bucks. Need to do well, I some things like rinds will yeah, just rinds take longer to break second. down. Um, yeah, you get okay. a half a watermelon. Yeah, it's okay. It'll it's like just take deal. longer. Oh. But I do know Years. people who are really kind of uptight about their compost, yeah. and they will. The Cuisinarting gives that the bacteria that baby food texture where they just, like, oh, you know, they just. Oh, yeah. There's the lawnmower. Fire. We forgot the lawnmower. Lawnmower is a great oh, tool. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, Running over your yard waste, uh -huh. your branches, your leaves, and leaves to shred up. and lawnmower. everything. You can run over your melon rinds with your lawnmower. <laughs> I made a little box. Uh, where I could throw stuff in one end and into cool. the combo. I did that in California. I haven't done that here. Yeah, thanks for reminding me about the that lawnmower because that's a great way. Leaves are another culprit of they, they form mats in your compost pile. If you put them in, they get wet. So running more with a lawnmower is a great way to do that. What's your email? Uh, it's uh, Ethan Smith. That's all one word. E T H A N S M I T H. Dot M T. You said E-T-H-A-N. E-T-H-A-N, yep. Smith dot M-T at Gmail. So Ethan, for yes. fixing our compost pile mm -hmm. right now, do you, so it's just too high in the content, it doesn't really stink or anything. No, I, I think that if you if you add a little bit a little bit of thank you um, a little bit of straw to it, I, I bet it's just a little bit hot right now. Okay. Um, but if you add a little bit of straw and if it's not damp, I just I'd wet it a little bit. The, the best moisture content is is wet. It'll say in your packet, but it's as wet as a wrung out sponge, so it shouldn't be dripping. It should just be moist to the touch. And if you mix that all together and fluff it and moisten as you do it, I'll bet it should start cooking down for you. Okay, and then do you think that we should just like turn it over into the next bed? Yeah, I, if I were you, I'd probably just scrape what little stuff is in the very last mm -hmm. bin back into the first one, put what's in the middle one, flop it over, over to the left, yeah. um, and then, yeah, as you mix it, move it into the middle one. That's, okay. it would make a lot of sense. And I, if we'd had more time, we could have done that today, but amazing how quickly an hour and a half goes when you're talking about composting mm -hmm. food, and food and all that kind of stuff. And then with um, with like worm bins and stuff like that, does it have to be any specific type of worm or can... You know, any, they say small red worm, yeah. like the ones you see in your garden, and I, I don't know specific species, but if you, I guarantee night that they're... Night You know, the bigger ones I've actually heard, like the, the large night crawlers are not as efficient at turning it over, mm -hmm. um, and they don't reproduce as fast. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming that if you you could put your bin on the ground and if you have enough food in there it'll it, you can encourage worms up. You could just sift some out of your garden mm -hmm. and you know there are definitely companies out there that'll sell you anything you want to buy. Yeah. So you could you could probably look them up online if you wanted to do that but I don't think you need to buy something. Mm -hmm. If you go to the Oakland uh, website uh, they've got all kinds of instructions about using worms mm -hmm. and they sell worms and they sell the things um, the, the problem with the worms is the feeding of them. 
Uh, some of them are really sensitive if you feed the wrong things to them. Yeah, you don't want to do meat or bones or I think citrus with most of them. Um, and we were mentioning with worms, uh, there's a couple of us talking about it, but if you have a worm bin in your house, it's a living, they're living creatures you need to take care of. A compost pile you can ignore, but if you've got a worm bin, especially say in your basement, it needs to be kept moist. They need to have food put in fairly regularly. You disappear for the summer and you don't give them water or food, then they're going to die on you and that's just kind of a bummer. So. The ones that the Oakland gives out, the 26 bucks, are, are meant for the kitchen. Hmm and they're airtight and uh, I, the people that have been using them that I know, uh, they just, it stays the right, they don't have to put water in it. They mm -hmm. just put their melon rinds and all their, you know, their kitchen hold on stuff. to the moisture and their... <laughs> so let's say that did happen, because um, we do close for holidays and stuff, and you come back and the little guys are gone, do you have to discard your compost then? Is that an example of... Or get more worms. Or, yeah, can you just add more worms? Yeah, you could, so as long as they're... The, the one thing with any, like with worms, I guess you could end up with, I, I don't know anything specific, but I would imagine you could end up with some sort of pathogens if you have enough dead worm bodies mm -hmm. hanging around there. But I doubt it. I mean, how long would you be gone? I, I can't honestly foresee that being a yeah. problem. I'm just, they, they should, I'm I mean, already, if you put like, enough food and moisture, sure. they'll, they'll be fine for okay. weeks and weeks. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's more just like somebody goes on <laughs> yeah. like a, a cross-country road trip oh, or a strange no. binge of some sort and forgets yeah. about their worms. No, right sorry, there. I just want to make you like, no, it'd be like five days. <laughs> and everyone lives here, like work all the time. They'll be fine. Okay. People well, are being legally required to compost now. That's great. In Oakland. I mean, I, where I grew up, you're, you're, you're no longer allowed to, yeah, it's forced recycling, and I think if they find any organic waste in your garbage, they won't take it, and you'll get fined, nice. which is, which is awesome. great. Of course, then you don't want to be the person who's picking your yard clippings out of your other trash, but I, mm -hmm. it's, people should, it should just be part of our compost. It really should. Um, great, well, I'm going to go home and build a compost. Yeah, that's great. I, <laughs> I hope you do. It's cooling off a little bit out there, too, so it's good work yeah. in this weather. Um, I do have to run, but if anybody has any questions, please email me. Um, and if, if your pile does spontaneously combust, I'd love to hear about it. Cause <laughs>